the beginning of time, bats have had a pretty bad reputation when it comes to cleanliness and disease, but how warranted is this? In this video, we're gonna have a bit of a chat about it, so stick around, guys. G'day, g'day. Sneak here and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. And today, we're back with a wildlife carer who's looking after 200 grey-headed flying foxes. And what we want to talk about in this video is zoonoses, or zoonotic diseases, which basically means diseases that animals carry that can transfer and affect people. And flying foxes do have a bit of a reputation for carrying these. And while some of it is justified, some of it is also unfair. And some of these are the facts that we want to get across with you guys today. So straight off the bat, there is lots of diseases carried by lots of animals. There's things you can catch from your cats, your horses, your dogs, all sorts of things. I'm just as worried about what I'll catch from my toddler when she comes back from kindergarten. But there is two major diseases that flying foxes can carry that can pose a significant risk to human health. The first disease that we're going to talk about is Australian bat lysivirus. It's basically like an Australian form of rabies. It's in the same family. In fact, we are wildlife carers who are handling these guys are vaccinated with rabies vaccine because it works on lysivirus. If you're bitten or scratched by a bat and you're likely to come in contact with it, they also treat you the same way that they would treat rabies. So it is treatable. Australian bat lysivirus has been found in all four flying fox species in Australia, as well as the yellow-tailed sheath-tailed bat. So out of the dozens and dozens of small bat species we've got, and the four big ones, there's only five species of bat in Australia that have been proven to carry bat lysivirus. So lysivirus was discovered in our flying foxes here in Australia in 1996. It's since caused three deaths. However, since vaccines came in and uh, the treatment protocols that we see today were invented, there hasn't been anybody who's been vaccinated or then treated properly after exposure then die. So it exists, but there's a lot of other things we need to worry about. On top of that, it's preventable. The simple things you can do to avoid it is uh, if you are gonna be working with flying foxes, obviously you wanna be vaccinated. There's a reason why I can come in here, I can hang out with these guys, but you won't see me picking them up and cuddling them. It's just, I'm not vaccinated. So we're not gonna be playing with these guys. It's not that they're gonna come out and grab me or anything like this, it's just cleanliness. If you aren't gonna be handling flying foxes, simple things is contact somebody who can. If you find one of these guys injured in your backyard or something like this, uh, best thing you can do, keep your wildlife carer's contact details on hand and they can come out or they can tell you somebody in their group who is able to treat flying foxes. So prevention is really, really simple with this. On top of that, it works out that about 1% of healthy flying foxes carry Australian bat lysivirus. We have had some studies come out that show that sick or injured flying foxes are more likely to carry it. Some studies on little red flying foxes show that as many as 7% of injured or sick ones carry it. So there's some interesting sort of thoughts that maybe when colonies' health decreases because of things that we're doing, deforestation, moving them on, scaring them to get them out of gardens, we could be causing stresses that actually increase these risks. But like we said, the risks are very manageable. We stay away from flying foxes, we get vaccinated. If you come into contact with them, go see your doctor and it's not really too much to worry about. Now, the second disease that probably gets a little bit more publicity is Hendra virus. Now, Hendra virus was discovered in 1994 in a town called Hendra in Queensland, and uh, it's caused a couple more deaths. Now, the thing about Hendra virus is you cannot catch it from a flying fox or a bat. The problem is flying foxes carry this, and as many as 70% of some flying fox populations do carry it, but it's got to be caught by a human being from a horse. Since it was first discovered, a pretty significant number of horses have either died or had to be euthanized, and about four people have been killed by Hendra virus. However, now that we have a vaccine where you can vaccinate your horses, it's pretty easy to prevent horses coming down with Hendra. And if we can prevent horses coming down with Hendra, people can't come down with Hendra. On top of that, besides vaccinating, which is of course the best course of action, there's other things that people with horses in flying fox areas can do. Simple things like covering your feed and water. If you've got water troughs or feed buckets out, uh, put a, a tin shed roof over them so that things that are flying over, flying foxes going throughout their night, their droppings can't land where the horse is drinking or eating. If you do have fruit trees or trees that are home trees or colony trees and flying foxes on your property, fence them off. You just don't want horses grazing underneath those trees. These guys aren't going to go out of their way to spread it. You just don't want anything hanging around underneath where flying foxes are basically going to the toilet. So to finish up, out of all the animals that we're going to come into contact with that could possibly spread something to us, flying foxes, as you can see, are pretty low down the list. Yes, they do carry a couple of things that we need to be cautious of. There's a reason why if you find an injured flying fox, you shouldn't be picking it up and taking it into a vet yourself. You want to contact somebody who knows what they're doing. But at the end of the day, there is just as many things that we can catch from other animals. 
We just want to make sure that we treat these guys with the respect and caution they deserve, leave them to do their thing, and we're not going to have to worry about them too much. On top of that, we have no option. These guys are a critically important part of the ecosystem. We need to learn to live with them because without these guys, we don't have the forests that support all the other animals that we love and care about and cherish. So they're a part of the ecosystem. They're here to stay. And it's as simple as learning to live with them. Now, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope you've learned something today. And uh, if you have, please head on over to Facebook and show some support to the wildlife carers who've let us visit their place. You can find them on Facebook as Adelaide Bat Chat. I'll leave a link in the description. And if uh, you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook. And if you want us to go out and visit more facilities like this, show you animals that I couldn't keep at home, uh, check us out on Patreon. All those uh, donations on Patreon is what gets us out to places like this to show you some amazing animals. So I'm glad you've enjoyed the video. Do those things we talked about. Be careful around bats, but most importantly, be nice to our wildlife. Have a good one and take care.